Brandon shares insight into a dog with human aggression. Smith. This is a beautiful boy that's just come in for being food aggressive to his owners and uh, probably with other dogs. For some more context, Brandon is in like the deep Los Angeles area. Like he's in oh. the rough neighborhoods of Los Angeles. Oh, as you could tell, I mean, like, look at yeah. like his his place is just like <laughs> like a shack, basically. Yeah, <laughs> right. Like it's it's a it's a wild place, and you see as he goes through, it's and like it looks like it's like the wild west of the yeah. dog world, you know. Huh. But he's out here just 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 making shit happen, you know. We want to see how he does with dogs, and of course, I'm going to introduce him to the puppies first. There we go. And let's see what they think about him. He's not even thinking about them at the moment. Look, look at this person. We'll wait till he comes back around. <laughs> yeah. And so this is the moment of truth now. What do we got? What do we got? Okay, the tail is wagging with the body, so we know that's good. These are the most energetic. Just some commentary on some of this kind of stuff. So he talks about tail wagging with the body. So typically speaking, I've always erred on the side of tail wagging is neither good nor bad because mm -hmm. it really, in the end of the day, just means arousal, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't look too deep into tail wagging, but I will say there are some truths to different types of tail wags, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it all comes off of looking at the natural carriage of the dog's tail, right? So different breeds obviously carry their tails in different ways, yeah. right? Like you have uh, dogs like a Malinois, for example, who typically have a pretty straight sloped tail going up this way. You have German Shepherds who have kind of like the low sloped down tail, right? Yeah. You got Pitties who carry a little bit more neutral of a tail, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? So when you look at the carriage of it, typically the more stiff and unnatural that tail is while it's wagging mm -hmm. usually is a little bit more of like a tense arousal mm -hmm. right or a yeah. concerned arousal mm -hmm. if you look at he described like the tail wagging with the body yeah. so the tail wagging from more of its neutral carriage and mm -hmm. the whole body kind of going with it a lot of times can be looser they're not as tensed up they're not yeah. as likely to act out but don't read too much into it. Like I said, tail wagging at the end of the day is just arousal and it's something to be aware of, mm -hmm. you know? And I've seen dogs that, you know, wag their tails before they start playing and wag their tails before they attack another dog, you know? Yeah. So you don't want to get too crazy with it. Uh, players that I've got here. <coughs> there goes Robert. He hasn't seen him yet. <laughs> Hi, Robert. <laughs> Let's see will even notice the body language. Oh, well, there he goes. All right. So he's going to be able to uh, double time. Okay, there goes Robert. He's in to see who he is, what it's all about. Three on one. As we continue to break this down here, another thing we hear in like uh, daycares very frequently, right, is because we have to micromanage dogs so frequently, they don't allow, like they call it, like dogs butting in with play, right? Yeah. So it's like they keep it groups of like one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two -two or something mm. like that as opposed to if a scenario like this happened of three dogs against one dog, even though it's just play or they're exploring and interacting and stuff like that, a lot of people have a big problem with that mm -hmm. and they try to jump in and micromanage. But here's the thing, and this is what Brandon talks about a lot in his videos, <clears throat> is the the overarching like concept of getting your dog better with other dogs and using kind of like a pack mentality to help with that mm -hmm. is that your more stable, balanced dogs that you're using to socialize your new dog are going to understand better than we can mm. how to properly put pressure on a new dog. And sometimes that's going to be more multiple of them that that dog needs to experience that pressure being put on them to know yeah. what to do with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So again, less is more doing less. Don't step in and intervene because you're scared of what might happen in this situation, yeah. you know? Uh, and again, I've, I've taken a lot of these concepts and applied them directly to how we do socialization, which is why I think we get a lot of massive breakthroughs. The only difference is I've put some parameters in place for safety. You yeah. know what I mean? Brandon... <laughs> It's kind of, like I said, like the Wild West of just yeah. throw them together. Let's see what we get, you know? <laughs> like, fingers crossed. Yeah. Let's hope nothing bad happens, right? I categorize dogs a little bit more appropriately, right? We know which dogs are going to be more appropriate for certain situations to put that pressure on. Mm -hmm. uh, and we always know in these situations, I have ways to intervene with all of them if absolutely necessary. Yeah. So. All right. Here we go. Hair's up. You can see that tail is up, but the tail is moving with the body. 
Robert's got that grip, sort of the takedown grip. <coughs> He's trying to get that mount, of course, because the mount is everything. The mount says, see that? The mount says, I got it. Look at that. But we know he's a player, you know? He's a player. And the interesting thing here is this dog has been aggressive with someone rubbing him on the side. Rubbing him on his side, maybe even rubbing him on his head. Then he growls at a human being. So why would he do that to a human being? and accept it from a dog. Why? Because this dog is being assertive and dominant with him. He's trying to figure out where he fits in on the hierarchy of things. The human being is showing love, which represents weakness in the animal kingdom. Everything that's weak in nature is dominated and eaten. Now look at this guy. Okay, he goes back with the mount. Perfect. But he doesn't see it as weakness. I'm telling you, we talked about this last time. Like, I've learned so much by watching these videos of his. Like, it's, yeah. it's so interesting. And it is, so many people give this guy shit, too. Like, I remember when he, oh, he started sure. kind of popping off, like, maybe, like, three or four years ago. And I remember, dude, like, I was fascinated by it. I found his page, and he just had hundreds of videos of this, you know? Yeah. And I would just sit there and just boom, 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 <laughs> boom, boom, watch every single fucking one yeah. of them. And other people, dude, I'd see these trainers posting, oh, Brandon Fouché, the fucking dog whisperer, you know, he just says that you need to claim everything and, like, you know, that everything is hierarchy and this and that. And it's like, what Brandon is saying is you need to just take it back to the core basics of how animals think. Yeah. Right? And yes, I think that there's some more complexity to it than what he says as far as there's a time and a place for obedience training and management and all those types of things yeah. when you can't always just let everything just work itself out like in nature. Right? Yeah. But the core principle he's trying to get across here is just understanding the socialization and understanding how the dog is perceiving things. Mm -hmm. Right? Look at Again, what he said just a minute ago in regards to why would this dog growl at people when they're doing a certain thing, right? Mm -hmm. But not at other dogs, right? In these yeah. types of situations. It's because they perceive things as hierarchy. They're trying to figure out where they sit on that totem pole. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, if our dog never experiences humans being assertive towards them, their owner being assertive towards yeah. them, a trainer being assertive towards them, something like that, they are constantly, if they're a more dominant dog, mm -hmm. going to think that they are on top of all other human beings and they can create those boundaries. Mm -hmm. So the more we can put dogs in positions where they experience people that are more dominant than them, dogs that are more dominant than mm -hmm. them, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. we balance them out on the totem pole of yeah. hierarchy. That's the point with all this. Yeah, that makes you know? sense, yeah. When we touch, it's weakness. And so we push a button within a dog. And he's not saying, don't show weakness to your dog. And when he says weakness, what he's saying, it's, it's soft energy, right? Yeah. To a dog, if we're always just giving soft energy to them, mm -hmm. if they no longer like it, they're going to tell us that. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Then tack on to it, he gets into some of these videos, right? We invade dog's space before we provide that soft energy, which is to them perceived as a very dominant act. Yeah. Then we do something that represents weakness, which mm. puts them even more in a position to then try to check us from that, right? True. So he's not saying don't pet your dog. He's just saying you have to balance it out. Mm. You have to make sure they understand where they sit with things. Yeah. That has been raised to feel that human beings are weak we push a button in them to tell them to become assertive, dominant, and ultimately aggressive. And then all it takes is a touch, a paw, so to speak, your hand on his back to set him off. Because a paw on his back or a hand on his back is the act of dominance, but we as human beings never fall through. We never follow through. And because we don't follow through, then to the dog, we must not something else you see we must mean something else but this a this is a battle of physical wits and physical maneuvers to show who's got the skills and they do it in a dominant way 
Doesn't this look dominant? Isn't Robert being dominant? Isn't this little guy being dominant with him? Testing him, challenging him. Look at front, back, three sides back. This guy says, hey, I don't want to be dominant. See how you kind of push back? That's what he has learned to do to humans. But it's dude. Come on. This like, guy's, yeah. He knows what and the it, fuck he's talking about. Yeah. You know, like that's it, right? He's learned because he was talking about the follow through, right? Yeah. It's not a problem that our dog displays that they're uncomfortable. Yeah. The problem is that we respond to that, mm -hmm. right? When our dog tells us, the owner, I don't like what you're doing. And we say, okay, sorry, yeah. buddy. Oops. Every time we do that, because we're so averse to putting any sort of stress on a dog, mm -hmm. we reinforce that unstable, dominant state of mind that they're in. Yep. God damn. <laughs> Much quicker. It's more of a disciplined bite. Where here, he's only growling. But even in the growl, this guy does not back up. <clears throat> he believes that he is more dominant He's talking about Robert. Him. He doesn't back. He follows and through. In this play mm -hmm. that we call dogs playing, as I say many times, that this is really just two dogs trying to determine who is more dominant without than the other fighting. without actually fighting. You see how he comes back on them? That's all this is. This is a mock fight. A battle of physical and mental wits to find out who's more dominant. As you can see, the one that's running in nature is always weaker. The one that's creating the retreat is always dominant. So they have established who is more dominant than the other through what we call play. Now, just imagine if we were to put ourselves in this situation. It looks much, much different. Every move we make, every touch we take shows that we're weak because we don't understand that this is the law. This is the law of hierarchy that you're seeing right now. And because we don't see it, because we don't understand the law, we're in trouble. As I always say, it's just like getting on the top of your roof. And if you don't understand the law of gravity and you jump thinking that you're going to go up, you've got some problems to deal with. <laughs> Same thing with the dogs. I'm trying to teach people how to one. look at why we end up giving our dogs away why we end up having a problem with an animal that is supposed to enhance our lives is enhancing our misery because we are lying to our dogs. We are making them feel something that we don't want them to feel. And the definition of insanity, uh -huh. we all know it is repeatedly doing something over and over again, expecting something different. And that's what humans do. We don't spend our time, our lifetime with the dog, letting them know where we fit in. We don't spend our time dominating and challenging them in a way that makes them submit through the way nature says that it should be done. Look at this guy. He's got his hair up now. He's making his hair go up because he's chasing him. He's making him feel weak, subordinate, submissive. He's on the run now. But look at what it took. Look what Robert had to do in order to get this. He's relentless with it. You see? If the human being early on would start to do this, this is discipline and domination. Why do I say this is discipline and domination? Because they're making sounds and they're doing something physical to each other. That's discipline domination. The human sees discipline domination as something negative, that those are words that are bad. That's something that you would do if you were. That was going to be something I just said before he said was that's why a lot of trainers dislike him also is because he throws those terms out there, right? Mm -hmm. Which, you know, they have all these people out there. They're like, well, science debunked <laughs> domination and, and uh -huh. then pack hierarchy and this and that. But it's like you, you're watching it happen. You yeah. can call it whatever you want to call it. If you don't yeah. use those words, come up with new words, right? Yeah. But that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. Angry person. No, 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 no. What dogs are doing, even when they're playing, is a combination of discipline and domination. But it's such relentlessness to it. Such physicalness to it. Such... Hormone manipulation and mental energy that's involved with this.
that it tires them out. You hear me say all the time that mental energy is more draining than physical energy. You can physically tire a dog out. That means nothing. But if you mentally tire them out, then you're getting them mentally and physically. But if you physically, it's just a physical thing. It's just a predatory thing. But how are they connected to the predatory behavior? They're not. They're chasing an inanimate object, running around, catching a frisbee or stick or a ball, which does nothing to what nature. He also talks very frequently about what he's kind of getting into here. Um, the idea of playing these games with your dog, tug, chasing ball, chasing frisbee, stuff like that, is simulating such an unnatural experience, right? In the wild, all it's all those games are doing is simulating the dog hunting, right? But the problem is they never get to finish the sequence, right? So dogs, when they're out in the wild, if they hunt, they chase, they grab, they kill, they consume, right? That's the reason why they play those games. In the case of throwing a ball, it's a neurotic behavior because they're starting that sequence and then never able to finish that sequence. And again, this is where you get into things that people don't necessarily like about Brandon because he recommends don't do those things at all. I don't necessarily think that you need to do that as long as you have control over your dog in those scenarios. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about this before with toys and tug and ball yeah. and stuff like that, right? But there is some truth to it. it's a neurotic game. You're just physically wearing the dog out. You're not doing anything to mentally stimulate them because they're not needing to think and process. They're just acting for however yeah. long you do it, you know? Yeah. As it should be doing. But you're waking up the same hormone that's not being satisfied. Yep. But if they're doing it to each other, if they are physically challenging and disciplining <clears throat> each other, then they can drain each other mentally and Thinking. physically. And when it's done, the balance is superb and so now we're going to introduce him to yeah. other dogs yeah. and yeah. we will have the same effect and everyone will try to figure out where they fit in and in doing so the bond will be created and robert he did a great job we'll continue <laughs> we'll continue i hope every video will continue <laughs>